It is practically impossible to name a set of teachings that has been more influential on modern day thought than those of Pythagoras, passed down orally from generation to generation of disciples ever since the attack on the Pythagorean community, which occurred at around 495 BC. There are also several mathematical and scientific discoveries attributed to Pythagoras, including the Pythagorean theorem, the five regular solids, the theory of proportions, the sphericity of the earth, the division of the globe into five climactic zones, as well as the mathematical relationship in music between different notes, called Pythagorean tuning. In this video we will showcase the essence of these teachings, as well as elucidate upon their esoteric meanings. In the description of this video is a link to the Golden Verses, the only authentic Pythagorean text which survives to this day, as well as a lecture by Manly P. Hall on these aforementioned verses. We highly recommend the reading of the former before continuing on with the video, and afterwards the viewing of the latter lecture, as it is extremely informative. Without further ado, we will now explain the Pythagorean way of life, and then their mathematical and esoteric principles. The philosophy of life which was taught by Pythagoras had as its main virtue moderation and temperance in all applicable situations, as he believed that an excess in anything, even in virtue, was in itself a vice. One of his favorite statements was, We must avoid with our utmost endeavor, and amputate with fire and sword, and by all other means, from the body, sickness, from the soul, ignorance, from the belly, luxury, from a city, sedition, from a family, discord, and from all things, excess. Pythagoras also believed that there was no crime equal to that of anarchy. The Pythagorean way of life, showcased within the Golden Verses, involves the worship of all that is good and honorable. For whenever one begins to venerate something or someone, they inherently and unconsciously attempt to emulate the values of said venerated person. This is why religions explain to us what is morally correct and incorrect, and how to live a life full of virtue and satisfaction. Even if we don't understand why, it is important to have these values as a goal and to venerate them, so that we strive to achieve them with our own actions. The modern man, with his false idols and worshipping of political figures, presidents, companies, or even worse, worshipping nothing at all, ends up extremely unhappy and anxious without any sort of control over his own actions and vices, and clueless as to any sort of solution to his issues. With this in mind, Pythagoras proposed another method of refining one's own actions, and that is by learning from the past, analyzing one's own life very deeply, noticing virtues and vices, praising the former and extinguishing the latter. This is, by far, the most important of the philosophic principles since antiquity, and it can be expressed in the famous quote, Know thyself which has been attributed to numerous antique philosophers, including Pythagoras. Socrates famously says in the Apology that an unexamined life is not worth living. One who deeply and truly understands this principle is well on their way to personal growth and progress. The next question naturally arises, how is one to examine their own life? In the Golden Verses, Pythagoras proposes that one must look deeply into themselves in order to find true virtue, always examining the past and current actions, it is also important to always perform actions rationally, and to never do something without a reason, and if one has a reason to do something, then to do it as soon as possible. In order to maintain this rationality, one must always be fully aware of their own actions, and always maintain temperance and be moderate. We, being human beings, are destined to fall prey to passions, but even in these moments, we must not let irrationality take over and turn passions into excesses and vices. Another very important point in the Golden Verses is a careful analysis and deliberation over one's daily actions. Pythagoras states, Never suffer to close thy eyelids after thy going to bed, till thou hast examined by thy reason all thy actions of the day. Wherein have I done amiss? What have I done? What have I omitted that I ought to have done? If in this examination thou find that thou hast done amiss, reprimand thyself severely for it. And if thou hast done any good, rejoice. Practice thoroughly all these things, meditate on them well, thou oughtest to love them with all thy heart. Tis they that will put thee in the way of divine virtue. In this manner, a person can be truly free of their material circumstances and passions, and attain, through hard work and practice, a truly divine mind and true happiness, regardless of the external circumstances of one's own life. Most people do not live in this manner, however, as Pythagoras later states. I would have thee know that men draw their own misfortunes upon themselves of their own free will and own free choice. Unhappy wretches all, they neither see nor understand that their God is near to them. Few know how to deliver themselves from their misfortunes. Such is the fate that blinds a man and takes away his sense. Like helpless leaves driven by the winds of their passions, they roll to and fro, always oppressed with ills innumerable. 
For fatal strife, innate, pursues them everywhere, tossing them up and down, nor do they perceive the causes of it. Pythagoras also praised silence above all other virtues, and said that people should exercise themselves in hearing in order that they may be able to speak. He warns man that his words, instead of representing him, end up misrepresenting him, and that when in doubt as to what he should say, he should always remain silent. Pythagorean silence was, in fact, greatly admired, and Isocrates reports that even in the 4th century, people marvel more at the silence of those who profess to be his pupils than at those who have the greatest reputation for speaking. The ability to remain silent was seen as the ultimate in self-control, and, as stated previously, those who wished to be initiated into the Pythagorean community needed to retain a five-year silence. There was also a strict vow of silence on the teachings of Pythagoras. On one occasion, two Pythagoreans, a man and his pregnant wife, had been captured by a tyrant after having split off from their companions who were fleeing from the tyrant's soldiers. These were then killed after refusing to pass through a field of beans, which we will talk more about later. The tyrant offered the two Pythagoreans great honors and treasures if they explained their teachings. After having all offers rejected, however, the tyrant asked them to know only one thing, which is, why the man's companions chose to die rather than to tread on beans. To which the Pythagorean replied, My companions indeed submitted to death in order that they might not tread upon beans, but I would rather tread upon them than to tell you the cause of this. The tyrant ordered the man's wife to be tortured, as he thought that she would easily reveal the secrets. The woman, however, grinding her tongue with her teeth, bit it off and spit it at the tyrant. This is only one of the many anecdotes and stories which prove the extraordinary faithfulness of the Pythagoreans to their oath of silence. Pythagoras was also extremely diligent in his religious rituals and sacrifices, although he advised his disciples never to sacrifice a live animal or shed blood, as these creatures shared the same divine essence as humans. He also taught that one should refrain from wearing the images of the gods on rings or other related cosmetic items, and to always sacrifice and enter the temple barefoot and alone. Indeed, Pythagoras emphasized the importance of religion above all else, of piety, humility, and solitude which go hand in hand in these scenarios, and also that one should never perform religious rites in the presence of others, always alone. All of this was in order that one may be in the right state of mind when performing rites, never having any motivation but their faith in the gods alone. Famously, Pythagoras said that men act ridiculously in exploring good from any other source than the gods, and that their conduct in this respect resembles that of a man who in a country governed by a king should reverence one of the magistrates in the city, and neglect him who is the ruler of them all. It is important to emphasize, however, that Pythagoreanism was not a religion, and there were no specific rites. Rather, it was simply a way of life which emphasized certain aspects of the traditional Greek religion. Pythagoras also emphasized a clean and moderate diet, always refraining from luxurious foods. Famously, he refrained from eating beans, and as we have stated previously, at one time a group of Pythagoreans being pursued by bandits was faced by a field of beans, and did not continue fleeing, as coming into contact with beans was strictly forbidden, and thus stayed still and fought their attackers with sticks and stones. There is conflicting information on whether Pythagoras refrained completely from animal food or just restricted a few animals and body parts, deemed to be more alike to humans than others. In this respect, Pythagoras seemed to have a connection with animals, much like that of Orpheus, another ancient Greek hero of myth, upon whom the Orphic and Bacchic mysteries were later founded, which we will discuss in our video about the ancient Greek mysteries. There are many tales of Pythagoras having spoken with animals and brought them to rationality. On one occasion, when a bear was ravaging a nearby village, Pythagoras spoke with the animal, and afterwards it was never seen to consume any intelligent life again. All of the written records of the Pythagorean virtues, other than the golden verses, survive in the form of aphorisms, or sayings, such as, The beginning is the half of the whole. All things accord in number. Declining from the public ways, walk in unfrequented paths. Govern your tongue before all other things, following the gods. The wind blowing, adore the sound. Assist a man in raising a burden, but do not assist him in laying it down. There are many, many more aphorisms and sayings, and due to its vast extent it is impossible to cover the entire Pythagorean way of life in this video. For those interested in more details, we recommend reading Iamblichus's Life of Pythagoras, which is one of the more complete biographies and full of other interesting facts. We will now cover the secret and esoteric teachings of Pythagoras, beginning with a brief introduction to Pythagorean mathematics. Pythagorean mathematics were certainly the most advanced of their time combining knowledge from many different mysteries into one single doctrine. They believed that, in essence, all of reality followed mathematical guidelines and could be expressed in arithmetic and geometry. 
Similarly, all numbers had a special significance in the Pythagorean tradition, and they honored these and geometrical diagrams with the names and titles of gods. In the center of all of this was the number one, called Unity, also known as the Monad, which was represented by Apollo, the god of the sun, and symbolically represented all of creation, the indivisible unit, which permeates throughout all material substance and the unity of all things. This was later adopted by practically all esoteric and occult traditions, such as Platonism and Gnosticism. We won't go into the specific details of Pythagorean mathematics. For that, we recommend a reading of Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages concerning the Pythagorean numerals. The text is linked to the description for those who are interested. The five perfect geometric solids, generally attributed to Plato, were likely popularized in classical culture by Pythagoras, who himself probably gained this knowledge while studying in Egypt. The five Pythagorean solids are the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron, each with increasing complexity. Pythagoras was likely the first to prove that there are no other perfect geometric solids other than these. The shape of the tetractus was also extremely important to the Pythagoreans. It is a triangular figure consisting of 10 points arranged in 4 rows, with 1, 2, 3, and 4 points on each row. It represents symbolically many different things. The first four numbers symbolize the universal harmony and the cosmos, as well as the four classical elements of fire, air, water, and earth. It also represented the organization of space. The first row represented zero dimensions, a point. The second row represented one dimension, a line of two points. The third row represented two dimensions, a plane defined by a triangle of three points. And the fourth row represented three dimensions, a tetrahedron defined by four points. Pythagoras believed in an essential mathematical harmony which governed all objects in reality. He was the first to recognize the mathematical relationship between musical notes. The story goes that while listening to some blacksmiths beating their hammers on anvils, he noticed that the sound of the hammers were musically harmonious and directly proportional not to the strength of the hit or to the anvil, but to the mass of the hammer's head itself. After some more studying, he developed Pythagorean tuning, which uses a perfect harmony of fifths, which have a ratio of three halves to tune musical instruments. The system of tuning was widely used until around the 15th century, when it was replaced by the more modern and technological equal temperament. It is said that the Pythagorean musical system was based on the shape of the tetractus. The rows can be read as the ratios of 4 thirds, the perfect fourth, 3 halves, the perfect fifth, and 2 over 1, the octave, forming the basic intervals of the Pythagorean scales. In the science of astronomy, there are also several very important Pythagorean discoveries. The sphericity of the Earth is commonly attributed to Pythagoras, although the historical evidence is uncertain. It is normally agreed upon that this idea was probably formulated in the Pythagorean school in the 5th century BC. After this discovery, no Greek writer of repute thought that the world was anything but round. The Pythagoreans also introduced the concept of harmony of the spheres, covered by Plato in his Republic, which states that there is a mathematical harmony and ratio between the movement of all observable planets and stars. They also held that each star was a world having its own atmosphere, with an immense extent of aether surrounding it. Venus, which beforehand was referred to as the morning star and the evening star, and not as a single planet, was likely first identified as one unit by Pythagorean astronomers, although again, this was probably taken from the Egyptians. On the esoteric views of Pythagoras, we will finish with some quotes by Manly P. Hall. Pythagoras taught that friendship was the truest and nearest perfect of all relationship. He declared that, in nature, there was a friendship of all for all, of gods for men, of doctrines one for another, of the soul for the body, of the rational part for the irrational part, of philosophy for its theory, of men for one another, of countrymen for one another. That friendship also existed between strangers, between a man and his wife, his children and his servants. All bonds without friendship were shackles, and there was no virtue in their maintenance. Pythagoras believed that relationships were essentially mental rather than physical, and that a stranger of sympathetic intellect was closer to him than a blood relation whose viewpoint was at variance with his own. Pythagoras defined knowledge as the fruit of mental accumulation. He believed that it would be obtained in many different ways, but principally through observation. Wisdom was then the understanding of the source or cause of all things, and this could be secured only by raising the intellect to a point where it intuitively cognized the invisible manifesting outwardly through the visible and thus became capable of bringing itself in rapport with the spirit of things rather than with their forms. The ultimate source that wisdom could recognize was the monad, the mysterious permanent atom of the Pythagoreans. 
Pythagoras taught that both man and the universe were made in the image of God, that both being made in the same image, the understanding of one predicated the knowledge of the other. He further taught that there was a constant interplay between the grand man, the universe, and the man, the little universe. Pythagoras believed that the sidereal bodies were alive and that the forms of the planets and stars were merely bodies encasing souls, minds, and spirits, in the same manner that the invisible human form is but the encasing vehicle for an invisible spiritual organism that is, in reality, the conscious individual. Pythagoras referred to the planets as magnificent deities, worthy of the adoration and respect of man. All these deities, however, he considered subservient to the one first cause within whom they all existed temporarily as mortality exists within the midst of immortality. This also refers to the Hermetic Doctrine. The famous Pythagorean Y signifies the power of choice and was used in the mysteries as emblematic of the forking of the ways. The central stem separated into two parts, one branching to the right and the other to the left. The branch to the right was called Divine Wisdom and the one to the left, Earthly Wisdom. Youth, personified by the candidate, walking the path of life, symbolized by the central stem of the Y, reaches a point where the path divides. The neophyte must then choose whether he will take the left-hand path and, following the dictates of his lower nature, enter upon a span of folly and thoughtlessness which will invariably result in his undoing, or whether he will take the right-hand road and through integrity, industry, and sincerity ultimately regain union with the immortals in the superior spheres. It is probable that Pythagoras obtained his concept of the why from the Egyptians, who included in their initiatory rituals a scene in which the candidate was confronted by two female figures. One of them, veiled with the white robes of the temple, urged a neophyte to enter into the halls of learning. The other, bedecked with jewels, symbolizing earthly treasures, and bearing in her hands a tray loaded with grapes, emblematic of the false light, sought to lure him into the chambers of dissipation. This symbol is still preserved among the tarot cards, where it is called the Forking of the Ways. Concerning the theory of transmigration as disseminated by Pythagoras, there are differences of opinion. According to one view, he taught that mortals who during their earthly existence had by their actions become like certain animals, returned to earth again in the form of the beast which they had grown to resemble. This concept, however, does not fit into the general Pythagorean scheme, and it was likely that it was given in an allegorical sense rather than in a literal sense. It is probable that the term transmigration is to be understood as what is more commonly called reincarnation, a doctrine which Pythagoras must have contacted directly or indirectly in India and Egypt. Pythagoras taught that everything in nature was divided into three parts, and that no one could become truly wise who did not view every problem as being diagrammatically triangular. He said, establish the triangle and the problem is two-thirds solved. Further, all things consist of three. In conformity with this viewpoint, Pythagoras divided the universe into three parts, which he called the supreme world, the superior world, and the inferior world. The highest, or supreme world, interpenetrative spiritual essence pervading all things and therefore the true plane of the supreme deity himself. The deity being in every sense omnipresent, omniactive, omnipotent, and omniscient. Both the lower worlds existed within the nature of the supreme sphere. The superior world was the home of the immortals. It was also the dwelling place of the archetypes, or the seals. Their nature in no manner partook of the material of earthiness. But they, casting their shadows upon the deep, the inferior world, were cognizable only through their shadows. The third, or inferior world, was the home of those creatures who partook of the material substance or were engaged in labor upon material substance. Here, this sphere was the home of the mortal gods, the demiurgi, the angels who labored with men, also the daemons who partake of the nature of the earth, and finally mankind and the lower kingdoms, those temporarily of the earth but capable of rising above that sphere by reason and philosophy. Such were the esoteric views of Pythagoras. Once again, we highly recommend the interested viewer to access all the links in the description and learn more about this great philosophy, as you cannot fit all of his ideas into one video. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you soon once again.